Hi, it's Chris. Welcome back. So this episode will be a bit technical, covering aspects I couldn't add to the last video because it would have confused everyone, especially me. So we want to cover four topics of telescopes. A. The concept of the lines representing the light paths in a scope schematic. B. The relationship between the focal length, the chip size and the field of view. C. The occurring aberrations of stars at the image edges. And D. The question, isn't it bad that the secondary mirror of reflection scopes obstructs incoming light? Why can't we see them? So first the main concept of light paths. Here you can see the schematic of a Newtonian telescope. You see the light entering from far far away, thus it's parallel, running through the tube and hitting the main mirror on the backside. This mirror is parabolic and has the ability to reflect light in such a way that every beam is focused in the focal point. Let's clarify a common misconception. It's important to note that all these light beams are from the same star. It's the underlying trick of a telescope to be able to gather many light beams from the same target. The wider the opening, say aperture, the more light beams enter, the brighter the image will appear. So light from the center region of the image comes in like this, and light from the edges comes in like this, this way and that way, you see? So the angle defines the position the star has in our field of view. Every star then has its own focal point, and I mean, that makes sense. If you place a sensor at the focal plane, then you don't want all stars to be focused in one point. Every star shall be focused onto its own focal point to be uh, distinguished in the image taken. And that's true for both, mirrors and lenses. I just created a simulation of a mirror to demonstrate it for you. With that in mind, we can go to the second point. The relation between focal length, chip size and field of view. See? Here is a simulation of a reflector telescope. And we place a sensor in the focal plane, so we are always in focus. Then we can alter the angle of the incoming light. This is light from the central region and this is light from the corners. If we alter the angle, we see that the focal point shifts. That's, I mean, that's clear, but with a fixed chip size like this, we can only go like this far. And then we reach the edge of the sensor and everything else is lost. Okay, so let's increase the focal length, but keep the sensor size the same. So here you can see that with increased focal size, we reach the edge of the sensor more quickly. In other words, only stars near the center of the image fit onto the sensor. So the patch of the sky we can image is smaller. Our FOV decreased with increased focal length. Of course, you can simply compensate for that just by increasing the sensor size. Fair point. Um, keep in mind, sensor size is awful expensive. So, and if we decrease the focal length, then look, even stars with an even bigger angle can be projected onto the sensor. So, in other words, we can observe stars that are even further away from the center of the image. So, our FOV is now larger. The images we saw last video showed actually two sets of light paths. The purple one is a light path from the exact center of our FOV. You see this path in every schematic of scopes. But the second one is the green one, and this gives us a handy information. The maximum angle the scope can project onto the sensor. So in other words, the FOV of the current assembly. Cool, huh? So this was the relation between the focal length, the FOV, and the chip size. We experimented with a reflector telescope in this simulation, but the relation is true for all scopes. Okay, the longer the focal length, the narrower the FOV and the shorter the focal length, the wider the FOV. So, um, now let's concentrate on the next item I want to discuss, the coma aberrations with mirror scopes. I created a simulation where we can look at the focal point of a reflection scope relative to the angle of the incoming light beams. So in other words, relative to the position of the stars in the image, center or edge. Now the light approaches from the center of the image. The light paths cross and we have a perfect focus on the sensor. But if we look at the stars at the edges, so introduce an angle, we see that the focal point doesn't follow a straight line, it follows a curve. 
and therefore the focus point at the edges is slightly in front of the sensor, so we are out of focus. This effect is called field curvature, as the plane of all focal points is generally curved. Our sensors are not, so we are left with a distortion here. Professional observatories or telescopes in space of course just use a curved sensor for compensation. Mm, but uh, field curvature is not the only thing. As you saw in the last video, uh, if not click the link above, we have another problem. Till now we only looked at the position of the focal point relative to the sensor. But if we look closer at all of the light beams, then you see that they totally miss each other at the edges of the FOV2. So we have a misplaced focal point called field curvature and then even a distorted focal point at the edges of the image called coma aberration. That calls for a corrector lens and there are plenty, but we will cover them later on. For this video I just wanted you to get a grip on possible misalignments regarding our light paths. If you want to know more about lens scope errors, try this link above or in the description below. Tim from Astroedict did a great job on explaining the main distortions of refractors. He's more the lens guy and I'm the mirror... whatever, just watch it. The last topic. Let's talk about the secondary mirrors. As you can clearly see, the secondary mirror of a reflection telescope is in the light path of that scope. It blocks some of the incoming light and shades parts of the main mirror. But neither do we see the secondary in our images, nor the shadow of it. Or do we? Now, this is a star focused with my Newtonian telescope. It's pinpoint sharp and we can't see something else. But now look, I turn the focus wheel and... What do we see? This strange pattern. It is the... Secondary mirror. Ta-da! Reason why we can't see the secondary in normal focused images is simple. It's way beyond the focal plane. See, if you use a common DSLR with a lens and a wide aperture, then you see the background or the foreground gets blurred out. That's because neither of them is in the focus plane. Okay, imagine this circle here is a secondary mirror of our scope and we focused on it. So it's nice and sharp and clear. That is because every point of the object is focused on one unique point on the sensor. I mean, that's the job of the optical system. Then we focus towards the background stars, and then you start to see the circle begins to blur. One point, say one at the edge, is now sent to different points on the sensor, so effectively smearing the image. Continue this, and the more the focus shifts away, the larger is the area on our sensor where one distinct point of the secondary is spread onto. And finally, in the end, there is no secondary on the image. But stop, it is still there. It's just every point of the secondary mirror is now spread over the entire surface of the sensor. This effectively darkens the image a bit and tends to take some degrees of contrast out of the image. But nevertheless, now where the secondary is smeared away, so to say, the way is free to observe the stars beyond. Clever, huh? Still difficulties? Try it yourself. Place a camera in front of a wire mesh fence. Then focus something behind. The fence will vanish. Well, not really, but it's smeared away. Same effect. So, that was it. Some things I think you should know about light paths and focus effects inside a telescope. I hope you took something with you and now have a better understanding of the underlying principles of telescopes. I put all the files we were playing around with as download links down in the description, so that you can play around with them on your own. All you need is the free math program GeoGebra. It's free and handy and easy to use. I'll link it too. And if you like this video and don't want to miss the next one, hit subscribe to get a notification. I think we will target eyepieces and magnification and its limits in the next episode. So stay tuned. And maybe share this video if you think it can help others to start their journey within this wonderful hobby of astronomy. So then, as always I say, clear skies everyone, until next time here on Catching Photons. <laughs>